on a late September day in Montana. A group of my colleagues and I here at Meat Eater collaborated with a team of archaeologists to butcher a bison using an Ice Age toolkit made of stone. The goal was to create a collection of tools and bones that might help unravel the mystery of how our fellow hunters survived thousands of years ago. Here's what happened. FedEx was like, are you shipping any weapons? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I'd like to use these Clovis points to cut all the tape that you put on these things. Oh, know. but we can't. <laughs> no, Because then we'll get we... plastic wear. <laughs> well, that's a big one. David Meltzer, archaeologist. And what we're doing today is we're kind of studying the efficacy of stone tools for uh, butchering bison. Carefully feel the edges of those things. And those are pretty sharp. They're sh the sharpest thing in nature. Mm, so, really? Yep. Yeah. You know, we're not familiar with skin and stuff with stone points, but seeing these tools, I mean, they're just not going to cut as efficiently as our knives. So well, I, don't, no. I, I don't know if our <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Yeah, just we'll give, see. It, give it a try. Yeah. And, okay. <laughs> we know that 10, 12,000 years ago, these animals were hunted. They were actually a lot bigger back then than they are today. Uh, and they were hunted with stone projectile points and then processed. And they were processed perhaps with the stone points, but then also a series of large, very sharp stone flakes. Knife edge, flake edge. This one may be sharper. So what's, what's your take on um, using the, the stone tools here? Uh, Hard, is it going to be harder or easier? Oh, it's going to be, I mean, <laughs> it's going to be I harder. I'm feeling the answer to this. We can, you know what we can do is real quick, just maybe we've got extra Sharpies, maybe put a couple more numbers on here. Okay. It's not to say that we're actually replicating or somehow acting precisely as people would have 12,000 years ago. We can't, right? This is the 21st century. But what we can do is get a better understanding of the mechanics of these tools. And we've got a, a number of individuals here who are really quite skilled and experienced in butchering uh, animals. Oh my Ooh, God. 69.1, do you have like a job like climbing trees? Or I used to be a tough guy. <laughs> now I go like this. And what we're going to be doing is taking a whole series of observations and measurements. This looks pretty good. This is 15.8. Like, wow. Oh, as yeah, they are going through the butchering point. process, which we hope will both tell us about the nature of the tools and how effective they are, but at the same time, maybe give us some signatures of, you know, the wear that uh, happens when you're butchering an animal, how these tools might break, um, what kinds of cut marks that they might leave on the bones of the animal. So a whole series of things that we're going to be recording. The other thing too that's so cool about this experiment is that it will serve as a model that we can compare what we find in the archaeological record against. So, you know, we butcher a bison with, you know, these flakes, we'll look at the microwear patterns, we can then see whether or not tools dug up at bison sites have that same microware. If they do, well, that's really great that it matches our model. If they don't, then we've got to start thinking about, well, what are these flakes doing here? What were they used for? Um, and so these sort of experiments really help us think about what we're really interested in, which is all the stuff that we are excavating to, to learn about the past. Yeah. So this is the Kent State Experimental Archaeology Lab, uh, founded in 2016. And basically what we do here is we recreate ancient technologies and then reverse engineer them to figure out how they work and, and how they were made. So as we walk through the lab and you see stuff, everything you see is a replica, whether it's pots or atlatl darts with stone tips. These are all stuff myself, Dr. Beber, or our students made. Yeah, we can make stuff from stone, bone, wood, metals, ceramic, really any material that was used by people in the past, we can essentially reverse engineer it, figure out how it was made, and hopefully figure out how it was used. That's kind of the main goal. Oh, yeah, because once we understand how all this technology works in the past, right, we can then build models of how technology evolved over time, and, and that's so important only by understanding how this stuff uh, works and how it was made can we actually explain uh, the last three million years of, of human prehistory. You know, we often think of technology 
always getting better, right, and increasing um, in, in its efficiency or how well it works. And just in the same way that biological species go extinct, technologies go extinct all the time. But one sort of less understood aspect of the Clovis point is its use as a knife, right? So we, we have very good evidence from something called microware, which is the study of uh, microscopic traces on, on tools, stone tools, that Clovis points were used as knives. They weren't just weaponry for hunting. They were also used for processing. And I think that gets us to our collaboration with Meat Eater and, and why we want to better understand the butchery um, of uh, a bison uh, with replica Clovis stone tools. Like how well did these things work? What do you think? Are they going to work well? <laughs> I think they're going to work well. I'm putting a lot of money on the flakes. I think that people underestimate them. <laughs> yeah, so that's the thing too, right? So we know Clovis folks would use their not these points as knives. Mm -hmm. um, but in the Clovis culture, we also find uh, these really large flakes that were removed during the creation of these points. We're gonna really put these to the test and see what works better, the, the hafted fluted points or the handheld flakes. Are you pretty confident about cleaning the buffalo? Well, I'm not cleaning it. Uh, one reason why it's so awesome that we're working with uh, Meat Eater is that you guys know and are experts at processing animals. And so we're gonna give the Clovis points that we made um, and the, the large flakes, like the best possible sort of chance to do their job. I'm really excited. I, I can't wait to see sort of Clovis points and Clovis knives being used to their like their ultimate optimum uh, effect. Um, I don't know if that's ever been done before. Well, basically, the points are one side, yeah. the flakes are the other side. Well, let me let me kind of walk you what we're gonna do. So this will eventually look like he'll be laying here. This half will be naked, and this half, the hide will be laid here. And then we'll this will be like our workbench area. We're gonna be working on one side, so we all just need to have the same. We need we ought to start with the tools. Let's go. So go ahead. I think we'll do the let's do the points first because that's gonna be the hard part. Number four, baby. She feels sharp, got a good length there. This is my tool. Can we just start on this? I'm gonna go from the sternum down to here if you wanna do the delicate work there. Does that sound good? Okay, you ready? Yep. 11, 19, 11, 20. That's that first cut. I'm in there. I'm still experimenting. Oh, there we go. There you go. He's cutting some. It's that belly fur. Oh, yeah. If you put some pressure on them, they really cut. You got to cut like somebody's going to come steal it from you. That doesn't look too bad. No, if this is like what I had, I wouldn't be like, oh, boy, this isn't going to work. I'm gonna try the other face just for a minute to see how if it's dull. I am kind of keeping one side. Right, because I'm doing all this hair work, which is typically dulls anything. Oh yeah. Yes. I'm gonna go ahead and make this incision. Get anywhere. I'd be uh, starting to lose faith in my timeline right about now, though with how fast the blade's dulling. When you guys need to resharpen, let me know and you can grab another one and I'll resharpen one. Shoot, we'll have this thing on our backs and over that mountain by lunch. <laughs> Are you guys doing anything different with your knives than what you do with uh, your normal butchery? Yeah, yeah. A lot sawing. more sawing. Sawing, yeah. Man, if you hit a sweet spot though, it cuts really good. Oh, for sure. So you're doing you want to come in from your angle? Yeah, can I get a yeah, trade number eight in? And Steve, I think, is ready to trade in as well. We'll give Ryan number five. 
Thank you. See, we when my switching oh, switching out knife, I'm just cutting this patch, and then I can kind of get back. Really? I think go from right about the nipple here. Right now, the goes into his. I would uh, take a. Yeah. Can I just pick up a new knife? Yeah. John, should I try a big one? Well, I'll just hold on it. I'm gonna try a big one. Right. Number seven. So that's how you sharpen them, huh? Yep. I'm just with the uh, pressure flaking. It's a pain in the butt to resharpen these when the handle's on there, but. Man, there's certain things these blades don't like, and certain things you're kind of surprised uh, how well they work. Yeah. Does it feel like it's getting gummed up at all? The big one? Yeah. yeah it's just not as, our, it's just, it's not quite as sharp okay. as the small ones. Is it a little more unwieldy? You know, for making these long cuts, just for not bad. the hide, it wouldn't be bad. You think your motion is kind of similar to how you would usually do it? Or? I like this grip. I would okay. not hold a knife like that. Right. Well, yeah, that's it. Look, the you would be. Like but you could. Okay, I'm working really hard to not make cuts any different than I would. Yeah, it's kind of funny. You know, mentally, I'm sure if somebody dropped a super sharp knife on the pile right now you'd be like oh my god this is so much easier but it's not that bad. no it's just not it's really not all right guys tongue out no way wow. heck yeah wow. you cut. we want to get a weight on it that's fine as long as that's freed up i'll have that hand it's freed up here point then if you could drop somebody from way back when into this scenario Footwear. they'd probably want a pair of car hard overalls yeah they'd be like dang that's nice but i guarantee you just like anybody who's ever cut anything they'd stare at this operation and be like well you know it's not the way i'd do it yeah but. <laughs> yeah guaranteed <laughs> yeah guaranteed i wonder if they were chatty though i've learned something about cal he's a little bit of a chatty skinner which i appreciate <laughs> Oh, baby. I mean, that's that's pretty darn. <laughs> How's that feel? That's clean for. That is beautiful. For just about Absolutely anybody. So. May I ask why you're measuring your weight? Uh, ready yep. one, two, three, We're actually trying to calculate meat per minute <laughs> as a, a value. Uh, for how efficient the tools are. It's 22, 22. Exactly. So essentially we'll be able to quantify the rate of basically meat off a of bone. Yeah. It's just a measure of efficiency. Now how are we gonna What's get the ribs off? On the ribs? Yeah. Do we just need to rib out? Well, they said they're packing away ribs. ribs. I think we should cut that. Cut them I think we should do the joint and pop. Yeah. Oh really? Uh -huh. Because that's the interesting deal is without a without a bone saw or a hand axe, you'd want to almost take the brisket, roll that brisket up to the rib joints, and leave it hanging like a little flap. Because you can't you, unless they used a rock. Yeah. Yes. It'd be great. I'd be curious to see. <laughs> yeah, but let's do the basket. <laughs> Ask as you shall receive. <laughs> This is probably the most difficult thing I've encountered with these so far is like kind of trying to do some trimming, removing some of the silver skin, um, just like stuff you genuinely wouldn't leave attached. Oh yeah, there's a joint above the brisket. No one knows about it anymore because of the saw. <laughs> Yeah, does anybody have a reciprocating saw? Oh, yeah. Oh, he broke yes. one! Oh, oh, got oh, John! Oh, ham-fisted John! The archaeologist <laughs> just got real excited. Wait, 
We want a picture of that tip in the bone. Yeah. Camera, camera. So you were going like this. In. Where's and the I tried in, pulling in leveraging. Back. Yep, in and leverage. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right, so I think, I mean, depending on, I can modify it too as I need, but I left a little bit of, of a handle here and we'll see if they can get through it or if they need to bash it. So, yeah, we'll see. How's it? You want more up? Yeah. Man, I I'm think if you had that axe, back, I think if you had yeah. that axe, oh, oh, yeah. we're going to yeah. ruin them all. We need that axe and a rock. I think you get John, that joint. get your rock, stuff, rock, go rock. to Texas, <laughs> bring some back. Man, we need that hand axe and a rock. I think you'd just be, I think you'd be oh, through no, this no, so no, fast. You want to try? Oh, there we go. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. That's just the same right. thing. Yeah. Let's make make, uh, yeah. make your dentist happy when you're eating your bison ribs. It's hard to handle. It's hard to handle. Come John. Yeah. Hey, Rick. Oh, you're doing a good job, Spencer. Thank you, Clay. Harder or easier than you thought? It's, it's about what I expected as far as difficulty. What I didn't expect is for the blades to dull so quickly. Okay, I got you number 10. Thank you. It's small but sharp. Yeah. <laughs> so hopefully it helps. All we have left to do is to cut the hump meat off of this side of the bison, and then we're going to flip it and use the other tools to totally butcher the other side. So we're, we're about done, though. It's not perfect. This we're hump meets the good stuff. You could Any takeaways on the tools that, you have yeah. been using? Th these tools, I would say, they work they twice as good as I thought they would. They get dull, but we've got a guy that's resharpening them. And it's just like getting a resharpened knife. When you get it back, man, it just cuts really good. So, yeah, these are like twice as good as I thought they'd be. That is a back hand. For the, right. No, in all, I thought this was gonna be uh, misery, but now I'm like, oh, you can just, just do it. Yeah, it's just not that bad. Absolutely. I don't really want to use the big blades mm -hmm. anymore, Choking like up. these smaller ones. Yeah, yeah. seem to be way better. The for smaller it. ones are definitely better than the the bigger ones. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, interested in seeing how the flakes work now. This one's a winner. I'm gonna go number nine. I can make more for you. Guys. I think this is a good way to get your hand cut open. So when you make fluted points and you're flint napping a large rock, these are the first big flakes that come off. These are essentially the the primary napping flakes. But I mean, there's no hold right there. No doubt that this is gonna work. I mean, this thing's it's sharp, sharp. as hell. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The question is, how long will it last? Yeah. All right. You ready? Good. Oh, it is sharp, isn't it? Very sharp. Yeah, I mean this this is sharp. There's no question about that. We'll meet in the middle beneath that old Georgia pine. I'm afraid to get any closer to you. I'm afraid I'm gonna cut your arm off. There's a lot of different cutting surfaces on this thing. Hey Clay, is that easier than uh, using the point you were using before? You know. I'm undecided at this point. Yeah, I want I'll, to give, you, I'll yes. give you a very strongly worded opinion. Okay. I think that these for skinning, it's, God, it's nicer. But you wonder about the opening cuts of these, if they wouldn't have made something that had a little, like, that you could get under and go leather to hair instead of hair to leather. Oh, no. Okay. Yeah, right. Okay. okay. Higher's better unless that's yeah, here, hard that for you. Place. Open that Achilles. Got it? Yep. Oh! Still intact. We're good. Did it cut you? I don't think so. I think it did. I see a little cut on you. Sorry, dude. That's all right. How quickly are those dulling? Can you tell? Mine's dulling. I've been using that same edge this whole time, and it was at first like razor sharp. It's dulling a little bit. But it's still usable. Yeah, yeah. Do you want it? Let's just roll it now, and then we'll make the cut on the front leg. One, two, three, four. That's all we got. <laughs> yeah, if you find the right cutting surface on your chunk here, 
it definitely requires a lot less pressure. I have this little tooth on this one. And then oh, you let that lead spot. the way and yeah. it just... Yeah, I mean, this is lovely. Yeah, this is great. We're just seeing how dull this got. Yeah, it's still pretty good, but I think we'll just give it a quick uh, resharpen here. There's costs and benefits to different shapes to your blade. And serration actually not only increases pressure points, um, but you increase the length of your edge. And so when you have a longer edge, you actually cut more per stroke. Uh, and so we see ancient folks doing all sorts of techniques um, with serrated edge or smooth edge. They'll do scalloped edges sometimes in their stone tools. So uh, yeah, it just depends on what they're going for. You know, you're just missing a lot of length with your flake. And it's, there's, there's gonna be some fatigue on your hand and wrist. That it's definitely harder on your hand. I'm not gonna lie, part of me is like, hey, hand me the, but we don't have that option. You think if it was half it, like the points were, that would work just as well? Well, you just don't have a narrow, you don't have a narrow, sharp thing. Yeah. If it makes sense, you'd like your hand it. is the tool because there's no separation between. So you can't put it in somewhere. Like remember when we were doing the rib rack? I just don't know how you're gonna get it where you, you know, you can't like insert it where you want. And I'm like into the joint on this side too. And it's the same deal. It's just, it's like the difference between reaching out and cutting with the tip of your index finger and cutting with your, the palm of your hand. Yeah. Yeah, I really don't like it as much. Are you still using uh, I'm still on number nine. Okay. And I, I mean, the way it's feeling right now, I could go the distance. You see old number nine in action. <laughs> oh yeah, there you go. Look at him, number nine. So Cal, if, if you had that that same specimen, but attached to a handle. Uh, I would like it better. Be a, a happier guy. Yeah. Okay. Is it Cal or is it number nine? Could go either way. I, don't, I don't know, man. But that is clean. That's museum museum display quality right there already. You can see with the flake how you can get a lot more uh, tumor from the bones. Yeah. Because you're in there right scraping the shit out of it, yeah. You know, the, the other places where it's hard is like what he's doing, even though he's doing a great job, just getting in where you want to, you know, getting in where you want to get in. But, I mean, that's clean, clean work. I did not anticipate, I've never thought that it would be this much resharpening at a bison kill. So this is just like, I'm reframing in my head a lot of these archaeological sites. Um, so it's, we're already learning stuff. We haven't even gotten back to the lab yet. And this is why you gotta get outside. It's lab stuff is really important, but you know, doing more naturalistic stuff is also really, really important. Um, so yeah, we're learning so much. I don't have a great impression yet. I think we're gonna see more meat left on the bone here. It's just harder to like get a good reach and a good cut. Um, we'll see. I, I just think that I'm working too close to the bone, too, closer than I would like to. Than before when I had the, the handle, I could really reach in there, move around. It's a little bit tougher here. We're getting there, boys. Mm -hmm. Hole number nine, and I got something to say about it. Hole number nine. Best flake you ever made. Legend. Yeah, the legend of number nine. Thing. Oh yeah. What kind of modern tool do you wish you had right now? A bone saw. Because you go along this same joint line with a bone saw and you're just cutting through cartilage, it's just you know. But without being able to cut through and trying to go into all these, I mean how many joints are we going through? We're going through we're going through dozens of we're popping dozens of joints.
There, hold on, let me get in there. Okay, that's very close. Ready? Yep. Yeah! Let number nine finish the job. <laughs> it deserves it. It's a kind of a victory lap. Clean ish. That's pretty darn good, man. Yeah. We're done with this, right? We like to be as complete as possible whenever we're conducting an experiment like this to kind of weigh and measure everything we can. We never know exactly what's going to be important, even if we don't think about it at the time that way. Can always go back and go, oh great, we have that that number, or we don't have to go, oh shoot, we missed up. So now we have the meat weight and the, the bone weight, and then I can measure the bone after it's cleaned and dried to know how much marrow and, and leftover meat was left on the bone. So this is the front leg off the bison, and this is the scapula. The uh, marks that we're trying to preserve right now are these striations you can see flowing down the scapula. Um, what we're going to do to not intervene with what we did today by superimposing more marks is we're going to do an emulsification for probably a couple days just to kind of get it broke down a little bit and then we'll power wash it. A uh, high pressure power washer, we won't leave any more marks on it. It'll just clean the bone um, and preserve the tool marks from the stone points today. Oh, yeah. Wait, me what side you're holding. Not ready to come into serious this is the side I was holding, which is perfectly smooth. This is the side that was doing the work. And it's uh, serrated the whole way. Yeah, cut joints, hide. It's a great multi tool because you, you just keep flipping it around and find the thing. Because yeah, the thickness is going to vary, kind of and the leverage you're going to get is going to vary depending on the animal yeah. and whatnot. And having it backed like that means you're not going to slice yourself. At the same time, you can actually exert a lot of pressure with it. It's If, if I had had some sort of a major malfunction in, in my gear, modern hunting right now, and there was something like a chunk of chert laying around, I would be very confident in, <laughs> in just opening the animal up, yeah. field dressing, getting it cooled down to where I could then go get some some more modern tools. You want to take some of these home with you? Oh yeah, for sure. After the science. <laughs> My impression of how the flakes were going to work was way off. I thought even though they were sharp that they were going to break and that didn't happen at all really so. Oh it's killing it. It's awesome. Anticipated the edge to wear down much more quickly than it did. We know that they're super sharp. We know they're sharper than the bifaces to begin with. Uh, but I always think of the edge as very fragile, and I thought they would be going through them, you know, every few minutes. Uh, so the fact that was it know, Ryan's number nine? Yeah, and Spencer. He used and number Spencer, two yeah. to do the whole front quarter. We didn't resharpen those flakes at all. Mm -hmm. So we do very controlled laboratory tests and you know, to do a different sort of test that's more naturalistic and more probably closer to what people in the past would have experienced. Just, we can learn all sorts of new information and, and we did already. I mean, we haven't even looked at the artifacts yet mm -hmm. back in the lab. It was actually quite impressive <laughs> to see how quickly they were able to get through that bison with those stone tools. 5.63. I told my wife I'd be home at like 9.30 tonight. Mm -hmm. I think it's gonna be like 4.30. It went way faster than I thought. Yeah, I mean, it, it really did. I, once we started making those initial cuts, it was like, oh, okay, this is very doable. Yeah, there was a lot of points where I said that, like, the most difficult part is that this is a bison. Not that I have a, a rock in my hand. Uh, oh, but it's just great. like yeah. the size of the thing that you're working with. It's just huge. And it's, it's interesting, too. Like, we are, you know, for the study, we're modern humans using ancient tools. We're not trying to replicate uh -huh. what ancient people did. Yeah. And I was laughing because. I feel like the difference between the stone tools and, and modern tools, like everything was so comparable down to the amount of like frustration and bitching, right? That's right. Okay, watch off. How often does a project like this, that the biggest takeaway winds up being, next time we do that, we need to make sure to... I think the benchmark for us is we want to learn stuff. And yeah. So many folks do stuff and they want to prove something. Right. And that's the wrong attitude. Right. We want to go into a study not to prove something, but to learn something. And I think when you've got that attitude, it's... You want to worry away your ignorance. Well, it's been fun because 
I've always admired your work. You've been on our podcast a couple times over the years. So the fact that that led to this, yeah, coming out to like collaborate a little bit on something. It's great, fun. Man. No, this yeah. is research. I'll talk about this day for the rest of my life <laughs> in a very annoying way, probably. <laughs> yes, you will. Yes, you will. And well, you should. Because anytime someone speculates on stone tool use, I'll I'll, I'll, set, the, fact, I'll set the record straight. As a matter I'll of set, fact, I'll say, well, it actually wasn't that bad. <laughs> let me tell you It actually wasn't that bad. It's, it's better than knives. <laughs> Excellent, excellent. I think if he holds it. Are you feeling? Mm hmm. Okay, yeah, I would yell, yell that again. Ben, what are the odds that Steve is successful? I think it's a good chance. I mean, it's a good platform, good fluting nipple. So as long as he's holding it with the leather down here, okay. you should be fine. Put it so what I'm attempting to do is I'm attempting to make a Clovis point. Yeah. By giving it its characteristic diagnostic channel flute. Yes. Now pretend that is a nail and that's a hammer and hit directly into it. But I want to do that little warm up stroke. Yeah, that point. Well, I don't But everything look good? Yeah, what, what percent success? Okay, look, look, look. 100%. Okay. When I come in, you liking it? Yeah, he'll get this out of the way too. <laughs> Whoa. Oh, that's but I don't feel like you're, you're I don't yeah, think you're pretending yeah, you wanna, like you you're hitting smack it. it. On your practice. Listen, man, let's leave it up. Let's let's let him decide. I did a lot of watching. Okay. Yeah, you want to just smack it? No, I want to do the practice stroke. Oh yeah, but then smack it. And this. Oh shit! You did it! You did <laughs> oh, it! Oh, I did. Yeah. <laughs> that was going to be a practice stroke. Yeah. Let's see. Perfect. Keep the flip too. What a nice plate, man. <laughs> that, was, that was my warm-up stroke. And you did Imagine it. Imagine how good I would have done it if I hit it on purpose. That's a pretty damn good flute. That's great. Look at that. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. Amazing. Just thought that's what I was, that's what I was yeah. thinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's cool.